And now I'd like to call to order the May 1st, 2019 meeting of the Park Central Community Facilities District. Will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Conlin? Here. Board Member Gervais? Here. Board Member DeCicio? Board Member Guevara? Here. Board Member Mendoza? Here. Board Member Nowakowski? Board Member Pastor? Here. Board Member Stark? Here. Board Member Williams? Here. Vice Chair Waring? Here. Chairwoman Gallego? Here. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from the March 20, 20th, 2019 board meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. We will open a public hearing on the feasibility report relative to proposed public infrastructure project comprising a parking garage to be financed in part by the issuance of special assessment revenue bonds of the district. Do we have any cards for today's public hearing? We do not. We have then a resolution to approve the report. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. It passes nine to one. No. It passes with one opposed. Yes. <laughs> a second resolution related to issuing bonds. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I'll move passage of resolution number PC04. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those aye. opposed? No. Passes with one dissenting. Yes. With that, we will adjourn our very productive meeting. Mayor, can I make a, an acknowledgement of someone? Councilwoman Pastor. I just, uh, uh, Chaplain Fesmeyer mentioned something in his, uh, in his prayer and uh, talked about people behind the scenes that helps us behind the scenes and make sure that uh, we're equipped and uh, ready to go when we uh, come to the dais. So I would like to wish Penny a happy birthday. Uh, today is her birthday. I know she does, is very embarrassed about it, but I think we need to acknowledge her because you do many things behind the scenes for us. So happy birthday. Very nice acknowledgement, thank you. We'll call to order the formal meeting of the City Council and ask the City Clerk to call our roll. Councilman DeCicio? Councilwoman Guevara? Here. Councilwoman Mendoza? Here. Councilman Nowakowski? Councilwoman Pastor? Here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Councilwoman Williams? Here. Vice Mayor Waring? Here. Mayor Gallego? Here. Thank you. Uh, we have an interpreter who is here with us here today. Mario, would you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Mayor. My name is Mario Barajas. I'm going to be making a brief announcement in Spanish for the Spanish speakers. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas y voy a estar sirviendo como su intérprete del día de hoy. Si alguien requiere el servicio de un intérprete de español, pueden pasar hacia la parte de atrás, acudir con cualquier miembro de personal de la ciudad para que les provean los aparatos para la interpretación. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thanks for being with us. Will our city clerk please read the 24 hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances numbered G6583 through 6588, S45544, 45548, and 45584 through 45626, and resolutions 21740 through 21743. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on boards and commissions? Motion to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commission nominations. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. We will now swear in our new boards and commission members. I state your name, do solemnly swear. I, Tyler Carroll, do solemnly swear. 
that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of the State of Arizona. And the Constitution and laws of the State of Arizona. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that I will faith faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of the name of, say, the office. Discharge the duties of the North Mountain Village Planning Committee. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. If you'd Thank please you. go behind, the council members would like to, to greet you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our new commissioners. We now move to liquor license applications. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Motion to approve items two through 10. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Congratulations. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business planning and zoning? Yes. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, Mayor. Motion to approve items 11 through 87, except the following, 26, 28, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 62, 71, 82, 83, 85, and 87. Item 54 is requested to be continued to May 15th, 2019. And item 86 is requested to be continued to June 5th, 2019. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Pastor? Here. Stark? Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Item 26. Move to approve item 26. Second. Any, uh, Councilwoman Mendoza. Thank you, Mayor. Last time this item was on the agenda, I had some questions about the debt payment service, and Jeff and Denise were able to clarify that for me. Um, however, moving forward, I would like to see um, the city uh, put some savings, of, put, put some savings inside when things like these come up, like the badging system. So as we identify savings, um, we should save that money so we don't have to be going and do bond finance every time we need something breaks here. So thank you. You some I wanted to know, um, do we have a maintenance uh, account? Or do each department have a maintenance okay. account for these type of items? That's new. Mayor, members of the council, we have kind of a decentralized approach that we're actually in the process currently of revamping. So each department has a variety of different funds available to, to deal with reactive work on their facilities. Um, we also have taken away what was considered historically five-year monies um, that departments use to maintain and manage multiple year projects. That money is now being moved into the CIP and we're gonna, we've actually got a new process in place that we're actually gonna leverage that money with the $7 million worth of additional capital monies that we put into last year's budget that we also perpetuated through the five-year forecast. So there is money available set aside, but I think what Councilwoman Mendoza is referring to is almost like a sinking fund, which some cities and some municipalities use, whereas as you have savings from certain areas or certain items, you reserve a portion of those savings to go towards long-term capital repairs and maintenance. So that's something that we can definitely work toward. 
Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes unanimously. Item 28, the form of the ballot for the special election. Move to approve item 28. Second. Second. As corrected. As corrected, sorry. Uh, we do have one card from Courtney Sullivan. Thank you, Mayor Gallego, City Councilman. Uh, my name is Courtney Sullivan. I'm the Executive Director for the Arizona Center for After School Excellence. We are a statewide nonprofit. We support programs that serve youth in the after school and summer space. Even though we're statewide, we are located here in Phoenix and we have a long and strong relationship with the city departments. However, we are concerned about the impact of Prop 106 on the funding of youth services, such as PAC and the Phoenix Public Library System. We have watched with dismay over the years as PAC has been decreased, shrinking the number of sites and cutting off access for our youth. In 2007, over 9,000 children in the city of Phoenix were served at 124 PAC sites. This year, we're down to 37. What has happened to the thousands of youth who no longer have access to these services? And what additional challenges are we adding to our families who are already struggling? This is, there is national evidence-based research that shows that participation in after-school programs or summer programs keep children away from negative influences like gangs, drug use, and risky sexual behavior. There is evidence showing that the presence of an additional caring adult in an after-school or summer setting helps build resilience in our young people, lessening the impact of adverse childhood experiences and decreasing the risk of substance abuse. There is evidence showing that after-school programs like PAC and the programs offered by our libraries reduce school day absenteeism, increase classroom engagement, increase academic achievement, and support the needs of working families. The future of our community lies in the hands of our young people. We should be doing everything we can as a city to provide them and their families with the tools they need to be successful and keep our city thriving. In my professional capacity, as well as in my capacity as a Phoenix resident and parent, I cannot support any proposition that puts our youth services at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work on behalf of our youngest residents. It is important for voters to read the ballot language and understand the impacts that the initiative will have on areas such as parks and libraries. We certainly need to get all of our voters the necessary information for them to decide whether they want an investment cap. Any questions or comments from council members? Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Item number 42. <laughs> Public comment on the proposed MOU between the City of Phoenix and plea unit four. Open the hearing. City Clerk, do we have any cards on this item? We do not have any cards. Do any council members have comments or questions or would like to hear a staff presentation? Would the staff like to deliver a brief presentation? No? Okay. With that, we will close the hearing and move on to item number 43, which is the approval of the motion. I'd like to move item 43, approval of the MOU between the City of Phoenix and PLEA Unit 4. Second. And congratulations to staff and, and plea for reaching an agreement. Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Astor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes seven to one. We will now move to public comment on the proposed MOU between the city of Phoenix and our firefighters. Open the hearing. City Clerk, do we have any cards on this? Close the very quick hearing. And I congratulations to staff and the firefighters for reaching an agreement. Any council member comments or questions? We have a motion. I'd like to move item 45, approval of the MOU between the City of Phoenix and IAFF Local 493, Unit 5. 
Second. I'll, uh, roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes seven to one. Congratulations. We'll next move on to item number 46. Do we have a motion? Move item 46. Second. Any council member comments or questions? Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes seven to one. Item number 62, which is an agreement with ASU and transit passes. I uh, move to approve item 62. Second. I have a quick question for staff. Please. Um, could a member Thank of you. our staff? Uh, Mario, it would be a true statement that the, I'm against light rail. Um, if everybody comes to that meet, these meetings, that's pretty well known. But this is effectively selling tickets that might otherwise be unsold, thereby offsetting costs the taxpayers would otherwise have to pick up. Is that a fair statement? Yes, Vice Mayor, that is correct. Thank you. Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Uh, yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes unanimously. Item 71. Move item 71. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we have a, a card from Richard Ray who is available to speak if necessary. Given the motion, would you like to speak? We have no cards in opposition. I have questions. Thank you for your service on our advisory committee. Yay, yeah, Richard Ray. Question. Oh, no, I have questions for staff. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, I think it's important to see that. I, I think you've all been briefed in detail on this. The situation is we've been working for 10 months to come to a grips with the uh, solid waste issues and the various uh, pieces of the solid waste proposals that come, in to, uh, come to bear. And one of the things that's happened is, is for the last 10 years, we haven't had needed to have a rate increase. This is the first year that we've needed one. We actually needed one last year. We did not approve the one last year, the committee, because it, there were some certain issues that needed to come to be studied. And this particular item uh, and this particular company can provide to us the detail that we need to make the kind of decisions that need to be made one way or the other. Uh, they've done it in a variety of cities, Santa Fe, Cal uh, uh, in the Texas area, they're professional, they're financial people, but they also provide a particular uniqueness that we don't have in this house uh, without having somebody look around and take a look at a variety of things that are coming into play. The biggest one of which is obviously recycling, and the recycling issue is something that they're going to be uh, not necessarily focusing totally on, but it's going to be a big part of it. So we're... Uh, we are, we are, we, the committee proposed and uh, accepted and felt like it was something that the city needed to make sure we did it right for solid waste uh, for the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor. Um, my question is, I would like to know, and I guess it would be also Richard Ray, I don't know, um, what the advisory committee, it said unanimously agreed to move it forward, but what were they looking at? and what were the criteria to move this forward? The second piece is, I would like to know what is happening in the recycling area as to why we're doing a rate, uh, or looking at a rate increase. It's a okay. little hard to hear you, I don't know oh. why. I'm sorry, I am asking uh, what the committee looked at and what was the criteria to bring this item forward and then, uh, what exactly is happening in the recycling area that there would be a possibly rate increase? Let me answer the first one. Uh, the company has been around, the individuals have been around 15 or 20 years. Um, the city and the people that proposed this 
uh, looked at their expertise, they reviewed and talked to the customers that they had used, and they came away with glowing, uh, glowing and very positive and affirmative things. I believe that at one time they already had done some work for the city of Phoenix. Let me go to the second question, which is one that I don't think I can do in 22 seconds. The world of recycling is undergoing a change. If you read the news, you know that it's going to go and change for two or three or four different reasons. Number one, we, it's a feel good. It's something that we wanted to do. We felt it was needed for the, the world, uh, for our country, et cetera, et cetera. The only problem is where do you sell it? And where it once was said, the material was once sold in, in largely in China, but in other places. And when China cut it off because they didn't like the soiled or contaminated materials, what they ended up doing is they began operating something where they said, we're not going to do it any longer. That meant that there was a need to find an alternative places to go. And they're doing that right now. This, all the cities in the United States are doing that right now which means it drives down the prices. So I, there's no way I could sit here and say, or prove, or validate that what the prices are going to be in the future. We know that there are certain things that have value, one of which is uh, the metals. We know that glass doesn't really have any value. We know that cardboard, the right kind of cardboard, does have value, but the only problem is there's no place to process it other than in Green Bay and some of the places on the East Coast. Eventually, the, the uh, business is going to, shall we say, readjust itself and find a way, but the once promised or anticipated profitability of recycling is now being studied, and quite candidly, that's one of the things that this particular group is going to be looking at very carefully. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, first uh, I want to thank Richard uh, for his leadership on the Solid Waste Rate Advisory Committee and all of the members who have spent uh, significant time uh, learning about our operations and all of the issues that are surrounding them right now, which are very much in the news. Uh, Ginger Spencer, our Solid Waste, or rather our Public Works Director, uh, can answer more detailed questions about the state of the market and, and the impact to rates. Thank you, Karen, Mayor, Councilman Pastor. Um, to add to additional information to um, what our Chairman Richard Ray expressed, the deliverables, the scope for this study, basically will include a comprehensive cost of service analysis. They're going to look at our different um, services that we provide, from trash, recycling, bulk trash, green organics. They're going to look at the, the, our customers from a front load standpoint, rear load, roll off containers, side loaders. Um, they're going to be looking at rate designs, uh, benchmarking comparisons to other, other um, cities, as well as analysis of recyclable material. Um, we do a fee forecast every 10 years, um, but the last time we had an outside consultant come in and look at our analysis was in 2001. That is the study that Chairman Ray re uh, referenced. At that time, the company that we're looking to engage today they were the sub-consultant um, on that contract. They were the financial arm. And so now we're looking to work directly with them. They are management consultants. Their area of expertise is in financials. Um, but they also have experience in the energy market, solid waste, waste and, um, and uh, water and wastewater. Uh, and they pr do these type of assessments for public utilities as well as private utilities. Uh, in regards to the recycling market, it is volatile. Uh, and that's why we're looking to engage this um, company. We can tell you what we're currently paying um, to provide recycling services based on our current contract, but we cannot tell you what we think the market will hold uh, or what it actually costs to recycle. We can tell you what we're currently paying. Um, other studies that this company has done, um, they recognize that the recycling market is volatile, so they come in and they provide that analysis from a public and a private utility standpoint with the goal of helping us to maintain low rates uh, while limiting rate increases. Um, and so helping us plan for future capital investments from a 
vehicles standpoint, facility standpoint, and leveraging those investments to, bit, to mitigate future rate increases. Again, it's been um, 10 years since we've had a rate increase, but it's been probably 15 years since we've actually had an independent um, study done on our financials. And so again, they're gonna look, do a deep dive and help us look at the forecast over the next five years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions or comments, roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Williams? Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Item passes with one dissenting, six to one. Uh, we next move to item number 82 which is a zoning case in District 6. Um, Councilman DeCicio did express his support for item, but if it is complicated, he welcomes us to wait until the June 1st council, uh, council meeting. We have 12 cards on the item. Um, the June meeting. Uh, so we'll go, with, we'll go ahead and start with the cards. Could you just, did you say that you, you spoke to the councilman and- So he said he's supportive of the item, but if it gets to be a complicated case, he is happy to continue it to a June, the June meeting. Okay. You want to? But you want to hear the cards first. I was thinking we'd hear from the applicant and the yeah, cards. Yeah, we won't know if it's complicated, I guess, until- That's true. Is that right? Okay, yeah. All that, right. I think that's what- yeah. <laughs> uh, Should we start with a brief staff presentation? Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, well, well, the PowerPoint comes up here. This one is a case for a special permit uh, to allow for a self-storage facility, which is item 82. Item 82 is a self-storage uh, facility request, for, which is a special permit to allow the self-storage use within an existing C2 zoned parcel. Item 83 is the height waiver to allow for uh, a, the units to be three stories in height. The proposed location uh, is a 1.5 acre site. Staff does recommend approval per stipulations from the Planning Commission. You see the subject site, here's Glendale 7th Street. It is back in behind uh, what many people know, the Sierra Bonita uh, restaurant and some other uh, restaurant uses like Habit Burger on the north. It's existing zone C2 property back here in the back as well as an automobile uh, lube and brake repair shop up on 7th Street. Uh, this entire area in green is the subject site. Uh, here's the surrounding zoning pattern. You see multifamily around on these sides and then commercial around here. The general plan is uh, commercial for this parcel already. Here's the proposed site plan that shows a two-phase project. Phase one outlined here in yellow in the rear part of the site. Phase two is the portion immediately adjacent to 7th Street. Again, these are a three-story self-storage unit that would be within the 30 feet height limit of the C2 zoning district. They just need the height waiver because of the, the three stories in height where the existing C2 zoning allows two stories and 30 feet in height. Here's the proposed elevations uh, for this uh, particular project. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission uh, recommendation. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, any questions? Uh, next, we'll hear from the applicant. Uh, mayor's member of the council, <clears throat> thank you for your time. We have a presentation as well that I will fly through very quickly if need be. Um, it's nice to stay on consent, but when you've worked so hard on a case and you believe in the merits of it, it's, it's nice to actually talk about it at the end. Um, we have worked uh, very hard, had many meetings, many uh, calls, uh, many emails with neighborhood uh, residents, neighborhood leaders, and you've probably seen some of those uh, emails and letters of support. Um, I would like to point out that the North Central Phoenix Homeowners Association also is in support. Uh, their two um, primary members couldn't make it here today because of conflicts. Um, the site, as Alan pointed out, I'll just skip past. He covered a lot of the good stuff. Um, there's been some talk that this is a commercial use in a residential neighborhood. It's clearly you know, commercial on the general plan and has the uh, C2 commercial zoning, as Alan pointed out. And this is actually um, 
almost a perfectly designed intersection from a land use standpoint where you have commercial at the arterial, arterial intersection, uh, a transition of multifamily, and then single family beyond that, and you see our property is at the uh, bottom right corner of the C2 red area. So we are sort of nicely buffered from uh, single family uses. Uh, Alan talked about the height waiver. We initially came in at 35 feet, uh, requesting five foot of extra height, and uh, it became apparent to us from our discussions with the neighbors that um, they would prefer it to stay at 30. Uh, not so much that five extra feet at this site was inappropriate, but uh, more of a precedent setting um, concern. So. Uh, to the credit to our client, he redesigned this, the project and we are now below that 30 feet. And as Alan said, the height waiver is strictly for three stories within that 30 feet. Uh, here is the site. Uh, again, C2 zoning it currently has access onto Flynn. Uh, there's a hundred and some odd C2 uses that could go into this site and would also have access onto Flynn. Um, but uh, through the design that we're doing, we're limiting the access onto Flynn and using a cross access, access easement uh, through Sierra Bonita to actually get access also directly to 7th Street. Existing conditions, you see that picture on the right, that is the existing building, uh, not a stitch of landscaping out there, and the parking abuts directly to the sidewalk. I think you'll agree that the proposal is a vast improvement over that condition. Uh, the phase two building that's closer to 7th Street, I just want to point out, you know, there are existing roll-up doors there. It is a garage, and uh, again, through working with the neighborhood, we have agreed to uh, no roll-up doors facing Flynn for our project. So again, an improvement over the existing condition. The alleyway behind the project, um, you'll notice that we're going to push the building towards Flynn, and parking will be behind the building. It creates a much better uh, pedestrian feel along uh, Flynn. Um, this is Flynn again. Uh, just want to point out the picture on the upper left, you see the condos to the south of us. I get a call once a week from residents in there uh, asking when this project is going to happen because they believe the, the ones that I've talked to believe the existing site is an eyesore and uh, they're hoping this project will actually kind of buffer some of that noise that comes from Glendale. But I would like to point out, you see those walls that are there. Um, there's either solid walls without windows, that's I think about 20, 25 feet, or there are patios and uh, balconies that both have walls too, so it's not really uh, like you're looking right out onto the, our site. Here is the site plan. Again, phase one to the right, phase two to the left. And you see the uh, on the top left corner there are access uh, through Sierra Bonita to 7th Street. We also have the alleyway access that takes us onto Flynn. Elevations, I'll just point out real quick that uh, this was not our original design from our, we held an open house meeting, no one attended, we were asked to hold another one, we held a second open house meeting and at that one uh, it was expressed that the initial design was a little too, uh, too office-y, too industrial, so it was redesigned and um, uh, we've heard nothing but good thoughts on this redesign. Uh, just some pictures. Access, I think um, that has become uh, a, a point that I've heard a lot about on this project, which is somewhat surprising for a incredibly low intensity, low traffic use. You see all of those yellow and red arrows right now, those are ways to access the site. Uh, the red arrows uh, heading onto Flynn, again, a hundred and some odd C2 uses could go in that site and still maintain that access onto Flynn. But with this project redesign, we'll be eliminating all of those red curb cuts, create a much better pedestrian uh, access point, much better street design. And there's the design laid in there. You see the building is pushed towards Flynn. Uh, new landscaping, I should just say landscaping in general because there's none out there today. Uh, also agreed to a detached sidewalk along Flynn, which uh, was also an interest of the neighborhood. And you see the access points that we still have. Uh, again, to the left, you're going to see the drive aisle and easement we have secured for direct access onto 7th Street but there is also the alley that is fully dedicated um, that we'll be using for access as well. And the right side of the alley, you see it's 20 foot dedicated, but with our design, it ends up being about 25, 26 feet of clear space for maneuvering back there. Uh, again, incredibly low traffic generating use. That's a 16,000 square foot retail comparison to a 200,000 square foot um, storage unit. And you see that the uh, traffic generation is much, much greater uh, than uh, what would happen under a retail condition or even what would happen under a, an office condition or, or a number of the other C2 uses that are permitted by right. I think at that point I'll just, uh, uh, I'll pause and stop and see if there's any questions and feel free to um, respond to any comments that come from uh, citizens. 
do not see any questions from council members. So I'll take the citizen uh, comments. Uh, four individuals have donated their time to Sandy Gruno, so she will be first, followed by Larry Whitesell. And so Sandy will have up to 10 minutes. Thank you, Mayor and Councilman. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here, and I just want to present the neighborhood side of this story. Uh, my name is Sandy Gruno. I represent the Phoenix Mid-Century Modern Neighborhood Association. This development is in our neighborhood. It is not in the neighborhood of Phoenix North Central. However, they've been very helpful. You don't see many, many neighbors here today because many of them are working, they're picking up children from school, uh, they're taking care of children at home, and so on. Please let the emails and the voicemails you've received be that additional voice to guide your vote. Let me provide you with some history. Uh, at the December neighborhood meeting, and, and let me just preface this with, Nobody made that first meeting uh, that they presented. It wasn't that they didn't care, but it was right. It was the week of Thanksgiving, and that's why no one showed up. Um, but they rescaled Jill, so at the December neighborhood meeting, it was presented that the larger parcel, the one that's more what I'll call inland from 7th Street, parcel A, would be built first. Then parcel B, next to 7th Street, would be developed. When we pointed out the exterior design did not reflect our neighborhood being mid-century modern, the developer was very kind to redesign the exterior. We truly appreciate that. Later, they agreed to the 30-foot height, as did the developer. Um, it's consistent with the development that was just approved a few weeks ago by you all um, at 6316 North 7th Street, that storage build. The council. Anyway, you approved it. In February, the Camelback East Village passed the height waiver. The matter regarding ingress and egress failed after a great deal of discussion, especially the unauthorized access to other commercial properties on Glendale Avenue. Two meetings were held with the developers and their attorney. At the first meeting, one of the two owners had a sidebar discussion with me, commenting how easy it would be for customers to come off of Glendale Avenue through Julio Berto's or Imperial Deli to the storage facility. I said it didn't seem right to go to across someone else's property. Together with our neighbors, we met with Alan Stevenson and Samantha Keating in February. Uh, Ms. Keating sent a follow-up uh, email which states, our zoning administrator found and access, found an access easement as proposed above would not be considered direct access because of the intervening alley. The information was forwarded to Attorney Morris. A second meeting was held with the developers and their attorney in April. After reviewing the plans, it was apparent no driveway to 7th Street had been added. One owner told me they only purchased Joe's auto property because it was a good, good deal, a great price. They may never develop that parcel, and I'll say that again. They may never develop that parcel. Therefore, there are no plans for a driveway, as they um, alluded to us, through 7th Street, through to 7th Street. The Village Planning Commission had questions, too, about egress and ingress. Although voted through, their vote was not unanimous. The zoning requirement is very clear. Storage facilities are required to have direct access or abut to an arterial street. The only arterial street is 7th Street. The smaller of the two properties, Joe's Auto, is directly adjacent to 7th Street. Where's the driveway? If they had that driveway, it, this would all be resolved, wouldn't it? By routing customer traffic onto the residential, Flynn Lane, you create public safety issues. The south side of Flynn Lane is an active condominium complex, and although you heard that our, there are some people say, oh, you know, this will look better in it, and believe me, it would to what there is right now, but there are a lot of people that are very much against this. 
Veh uh, vehicles exiting to Flynn Lane will create cut through traffic to 8th Place, Lamar, Lawrence Road, Okatia, and 10th Streets. Um, you were shown some of the neighborhood. What you didn't see is the larger neighborhood uh, that Flynn Lane runs into. In those, you didn't see that in the, um, the map that was portrayed. 90% uh, of our neighborhood was developed without sidewalks. Therefore, residents, including children, must walk in the street. This neighborhood is surrounded by four public elementary schools and several religious schools. Many children do walk to school. This neighborhood is within the Phoenix Community Orthodox of Rouve. Friday at sunset through Saturday at sunset, the tradition finds many families walking in our rolling curb streets. Again, no sidewalks. Think public safety. Let's talk about that commercial alley. It's 20 feet wide commercial alley. It services Sierra Bonita with a capacity of 200 plus customers. It also services Julio Berto's, Imperial Deli, and of course the property in question. Service trucks such as Shamrock Foods, UPS, and Cisco present a roadblock when offloading their goods. I've been there, I've seen it, it's happened. Storage customers will add to the commercial alley, traffic arriving in moving vans and in cars. Placing the storage entrance in a commercial alley with a second story overhang and no fencing creates an unplanned shelter for the transients who now frequent this area, specifically 7th Street and Glendale. Think public safety. We now have nine operating storage facilities in a three mile radius. <clears throat> Recently, two storage facilities were approved on 7th Street north of Bethany Road. If the 7th Street and Flynn Lane facility is approved, we will have three new storage facilities in less than one mile, or 12 storage facilities in a three mile radius. If those fa storage facilities were required to have direct access or abut to an arterial street, why doesn't this developer be held to the same standard. I'll ask it again. If those storage facilities are required to have direct access to or abut to a main arterial, why isn't this developer required to do the same? Although we are a mid-century modern neighborhood, we do invite change while maintaining a safe, vibrant neighborhood. We ask you to vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Mary Mulligan has donated her time to Larry, so up to four minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. I'm Larry Whitesell. I live at 7120 North 20th Street. And I would like to ask for the arterial um, slide to, no, the access slide to be projected on the screen again, please, if I could. And I also would request Mayor Gallego that I might also have the remainder of Sandy's time. If I might need it, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. You're being handed a letter from an investor, a commercial property investor that I'm going to allude to in my presentation today. My preference is to deny, for you to deny this application for all of the reasons that Ms. Grineau has already mentioned, uh, that being compliance with the zoning ordinance requiring access from an arterial street, the issue of access. Oh, could I have the access, the access slide, access option slide, please? The issue with access uh, being primarily off of Flynn Lane, but also through the uh, alleyway that separates uh, Sierra Bonita Grill on the north and Joe's Automotive on the south, as well as encouraging cut through traffic through parking lots of other businesses, which actually is against the law. I would also like to echo the public safety concerns for pedestrian and vehicular traffic around the site. I would also like to echo that the plan as presented does not provide for security fencing, which often is associated with this kind of facility. 
and that in turn would lead to the opportunity for homeless people to use the overhanging, uh, the overhang of the building as a shelter that would be hidden from public view. Uh, that does present a public safety uh, concern for you, I would, I would hope. Um, I would also like to uh, just highlight one sentence from Mr. Ward's letter, which you have received. He is a, an investor in public properties or in uh, commercial properties, and he says in his letter, as an investor, what I see concerns me is there is clearly a herd mentality in this market segment. As such, we have changed our investment criteria to exclude self-storage projects going forward. He cites the preponderance of self-storage facilities in this specific neighborhood as well as in the Phoenix market. I have a compromise. If you are so inclined to approve the concept of a storage facility, I have a compromise to suggest that I think would solve many of the issues that I have and that the neighborhood has. That is to ask for two additional stipulations. One of those stipulations is that phase one and phase two be built simultaneously. That enables ingress and egress to be done from the site itself, not from Flynn, not from the alley separating the two existing businesses, and not clogging up the access to the, the businesses along Glendale that use the alley for their operational uh, deliveries. It also removes the inherent issues with the, well, I've already said that, with the businesses that abut it to the north. The second stipulation is that the building be oriented to face Flynn Lane rather than to back up to Flynn Lane. This has advantages because it enables the, uh, the establishment or the installation of a security fence that is customary for this type of facility. It also provides visibility that would discourage the use of the overhang by transients uh, who might happen to breach the security fencing. The zoning staff, uh, Phoenix zoning staff, uh, was uh, instructive of the developer and the attorney representing the developer to orient the building with the, with the face of the building to the north rather than to the south because of a concern with noise of the, for the apartment uh, dwellers on the south side of the project. I'm not sure if staff considered fully the hours of operation of the facility, which are during regular business hours and actually fall outside of the noise ordinance that the city of Phoenix has established. I don't think noise, therefore, would be an issue. Also, it has been noted that the uh, apartments uh, directly abutting uh, across Flynn Lane are mostly solid walls uh, and that noise should not be an issue for those units. I believe that the staff made their decision without fully considering all of the negative impacts that have been presented to you today with the building facing north and the many benefits of the facility facing south that have now been enumerated. Weighing both orientations, I believe the zoning staff and you will come to the conclusion that a south-facing orientation is advantageous and should be stipulated to gain your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for applicant neighbors or staff? I guess I'd like to know what the applicant mayor has to say about the stipulations that were With just the, yeah. proffered. Yes. Okay, so we will ask the applicant to return to the microphone. Sure. Uh, Councilman Waring, I, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Was it? Uh, uh, we would if, like you, your input on the stipulations that the neighborhood Oh, offered. sure. Um, market is being discussed. There are people much smarter than me that know market concerns, but I would say this is pretty much an ideal situation if market is indeed your concern. Uh, there are actually only two facilities within two miles of this, one north on Dunlap and one to the east, uh, right at the edge of that yeah. two-mile radius. Apologies. Th the question was about access to 7th Street and building orientation. Okay, perfect. Um, this kind of plays into the access into 7th Street, if, if I may. Um, there are other cases that have been proposed, but there are only two actually existing. So 
But if market is your concern, this is ideal in that phase one can go first, and if there's market demand left over, they can build phase two. Mar phase one on the, on the right side of the site plan has an access easement through Sierra Bonita. Now, we believe that meets the intent of the code and would require a variance for that access, but phase two, if it goes forward, has direct access to 7th Street. Um, I would not uh, want our client to build it all at once um, because there is an alley in the middle. Um, there is, you know, I think a phase approach is much better than that. So uh, I don't think we'd be agreeable to such a stipulation. Um, but should phase two happen and should it happen as a storage facility, it has direct access right to 7th Street. Councilwoman Stark? Yeah, I, this is a question maybe uh, for Alan, but the stipulation that deals with the right turn only, is that going to have a park shop or something so that it forces the person to turn right? Mayor Councilwoman Stark, yes, they would have to uh, put signage and design something so that it is, uh, follows the direction of only making that right turn. Okay, and then just to follow up on that, currently, if I recall, there were about four different access points to Flynn right now. Four access, so this would then restrict it to two, including the one that would go right only. Mayor Councilman Stark, you, you are correct. The, the existing shopping center as shown uh, right here shows all the access points that go down to Flynn. It is a shopping center that has a small parking lot facing the neighborhood. And what staff worked with the applicant to do was flip that around so that the uh, traffic generated, even though it's much less for a self-storage use than a retail use, would be in between other commercial areas instead of uh, to the south where you have the existing apartments. And so if, if they didn't have this special permit and they had the C2, those four access points could remain today and that could redevelop to commercial that could be as high as 30 feet anyway, correct? Mayor uh, and Councilman Stark, that is correct. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Councilman Pastor. And reading uh, Brian Ward's letter, uh, the question is, should a self-storage facility fail, what is the adapted reuse for something like this besides tearing it down? Is that a question for the applicant or no, is it for first step? So Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, um, if it is not successful, uh, they would likely reuse the shell of the building because it would be built uh, fairly soon. They would have to work on uh, you know, occupancy issues to do more um, uh, some type of office use would be the likely, uh, you know, use if they wanted to, to do that. The special permit does allow them to do some of the underlying uses in C2 that they can do by right today. So there are other options uh, that they would, would develop and do if that was what, uh, what happened in the future. They obviously would have to meet parking requirements and all those things for any other use, just like any other adaptive reuse project would. Okay. And then the gentleman had uh, some stipulations. I can't remember, I don't know where, where is he? One of the stipulations was to be, be yeah, and I, I heard that one and then I. There's really only uh, east-west access, I mean west to east access in the alley between Sierra Bonita and the garage. If you notice, the, there is parking on the south side of that, on, yes, on the south side of that alley, and the parking spaces are diagonal facing, so that people coming off of 7th Street will diagonally park facing southeast, and then they leave going toward the uh, east. So there is no real exit uh, from the project through the Sierra Bonita parking lot. It has to go then either onto Flynn or onto 8th or through the business parking lots to the north.
Councilwoman Stark. Mayor, I, I'd be happy to make a motion. I, um, first off, I think um, you got communication from Councilman DeCicio, and so he said it, he was okay with the case. So I would, one thing I would want to make sure is on the right turn only that we do more than just signage. Would you be willing to do that? Okay. Yes, Councilman. So if we could modify that so that we're assured that they are going to make a right turn and only a right turn. So some kind of structure, pork chop, something like that. Mayor, uh, Councilman Stark, just for the, the record, this case was not appealed. So we can't add stipulations to it. It's on for ratification. Oh. Um, we can, I think the applicant uh, can agree, and, and if they abide by that, then staff will work with on that, but we can't add stipulations at this time. So would you agree to that? Uh, council member, um, yes, we would. Um, okay, thank you. Then. I think working through our site plan, we'll figure out some way to ensure okay. that it's just right in. Then I would move to approve this item per the Planning Commission approval at its April 4th, 2019 meeting and adopt the related ordinance. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Council finish the, the question. I, there were questions and you weren't able to answer it. I just would like you to answer it for the sure. record. Sure. I, I believe the other stipulation was if we could reverse the orientation of the building and I, I think um, uh, the planning staff would also agree that our current layout is more adequate for a urban infill site. A building pushed towards the street, a detached sidewalk, landscaping, uh, that's as safe and as comfortable as you can get on a pedestrian walkway. And the back uh, parking behind a building is like an ideal request that the cities often ask. So I, I think our layout is, is currently actually more than adequate. Are we ready for roll call or? All right, uh, Councilwoman Mendoza would like uh, to hear from Sandy. Um, well, I just want to tell you that I met for an hour and a half with Sam Stone last week, and at the end of the discussion, his comment was, and if I can say this, um, or I will say it, Sal DeCiso has a soft yes on this. That was what I was told. It was not an emphatic yes, it was a soft yes. So you can read that as you all would understand probably better than I would, but I, I think that needs to be known. Thank you. Any further council member questions? All right, roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Item 83 is a related case. Do we have a motion uh, uh, on item 83? Mayor, members of council, I, a motion just like you made on the last one would be fine. Motion to approve it per the planning commission and adopt the related ordinance. Mayor, I move item 83 uh, per the planning commission recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Any comments or questions? Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. Item passes unanimously. Item 85 is a case in District 8. We do have one card from the applicant uh, who is willing to speak if necessary. Councilwoman Mendoza, what would you like to do? Thank you, Mayor. I also have uh, the same issue uh, in this case with the driveway, uh, but the applicant is here and he wants to enter something into the record. Uh, Mayor and members of council, Councilman Mendoza, to follow up on our conversation from yesterday with uh, the Planning and Development Director, Alan Stevenson, I received a letter from the applicant property owner and I'm reading it into the record to address the same similar type of issues on access. This is April 30th, 2019, rezoning application 119-8 to Mayor and, Council and Phoenix City Council. Rabo Agri Finance LLC is committed to 
resolve the depth of access issues off of 32nd Street through the variance procedures that will be necessary by shifting the principal structure to the west or adjusting building square footage and gate location to accomplish the same effect. We understand the concern raised with the council staff and we are committed to resolve these issues regarding access to the satisfaction of District 8 office. Please do not hesitate to call me or, or contact me if you have any questions. This was signed sincerely by Rabo Agrofinance LLC, Roger Becker, and he is the vice president of the company. And we are committed to do this as well as my personal commitment will get this done. Thank you, sir. You bet. And with that, I approve to amend the Phoenix Zoning Ordinance, Section 601 of the Zoning Map of the City of Phoenix by adopting rezoning application Z1198 and rezone the site from R1-6 to CPGCP for distribution warehouse. Second. And the related ordinance. ordinance. I think that was a great... Councilwoman men mentioned that, yeah, it would like to adopt the related ordinance. She <laughs> would, okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. Okay. Roll call. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We next move to item 87, which is a public hearing uh, with uh, ASME Local 2384 to present position statements and address unresolved issues. This is not the agenda item where we will take action, so today is to gather information. Um, each side will have 10 minutes to present, and then we will have up, up to 10 minutes. Each side will have up to 10 minutes to present. Uh, you certainly are not required to take all 10 minutes. And then we'll have up to 20 minutes of public comments. We will come back at our next council meeting to take action on this item. So with that, I will open the public hearing. Uh, the city will present first, followed by Unit 2. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Good afternoon. With me today is Xavier Frost, Acting Deputy Director for Labor Relations, and David Matthews, Deputy HR Director and Chief Negotiator for Unit 2. We're here today to um, present the unresolved negotiation issues with AFSME, um, which stands for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 2384. Our presentation today will include background information on the bargaining unit itself, the approach taken during the meet and confer negotiations process, the procedural timeline that has been followed, a summary of unresolved issues, and recommendations regarding how to resolve the remaining issues. AFSME Local 2384 represents bargaining unit two which is made up of, of approximately 1,500 hardworking city employees. These 1,500 individuals provide valuable core services to our community. There are electricians, there are water services, utility technicians who fix broken or leaking pipes, our operations and maintenance technicians ensuring that our water treatment plants are operating successfully. They are technology specialists and building maintenance workers, amongst other things. Unit and two employees are highly skilled members of our city team, and we thank each of them for their services that they provide to improve the quality of life in our community each and every day. As we have approached our negotiations with both our five meet and confer units, our unions, and our two meet and discuss groups, our associations, and we have also simultaneously been preparing for the fiscal year 1920 budget, our team discussed the fact that our approach must be balanced, and it must recognize four important things. One, it must recognize our employees. To be competitive in the current marketplace, we must strive to provide competitive wages and benefits while also recognizing the value of our existing step or merit system, as well as our steep pension cost increases. Second, the approach must recognize our residents. We must balance employee needs with resident and community needs for programs and services. Third, it must recognize our future and be financially sustainable. The last thing we want to do is negotiate contracts that feel good now but force us into concessions in future years. 
the contracts must be financially sustainable. And finally, our balanced approach must recognize operational needs and the ability to meet those needs for the benefit of our residents and our community. The approach we have taken with all of our bargaining units, including Unit 2, has been this balanced approach. The projected budget surplus for fiscal year 1920 has been divided 70%, 30%, with 70% proposed to go toward employee compensation and increase pension and or workers' compensation costs and 30% proposed to go toward restoring or adding community services and programs. We believe we've taken this balanced approach. The meet and confer process we have followed as we've negotiated with AFSCME 2384 representing Unit 2 has followed the process outlined in the city code. Negotiations began on January 8th of this year. Impasse was declared on March 4th, 2019 Five issues remained unresolved with AFSCME 2384, economics, and four work rules. Those issues went to fact-finding hearing on March 27th and 28th. Since that time, we have continued negotiating but have been unable to reach an agreement. Position statements were submitted to the City Council by both sides on April 19th, and today we are conducting the public hearing. The unresolved negotiation issues that remain are in two categories, economics and work rules. Again, the city's approach is to be balanced, to offer a fair, sustainable compensation package and to promote consistent expectations for all city employees through elimination of procedural disparities. This slide illustrates the economic proposals that were submitted to fact-finding by each side. The city proposed a 2% ongoing increase to total compensation in year one. AFSCME 2384 proposed a 7% increase plus a $1,000 one-time payment for each unit member. Oh, there we go. Um, the city also proposed a 1% ongoing increase to total compensation in year two. AFSCME 2384 proposed an additional 7% increase. The city proposed a two-year contract. AFSCME 2384 proposed a three-year contract with a 5% increase in year three. It is important to note that the city's offer submitted to fact-finding was such because we never received a counterproposal from AFSCME 2384 prior to fact-finding. It is also very important to note that each and every union was offered the additional 0.25% signing incentive for reaching agreement prior to fact-finding. This offer was made to Unit 2 and they declined to accept it. This slide illustrates the fact-finder's recommendation as well as the most recent economic proposals and offers. In year one, the fact-finder recommended a 2.25% ongoing increase and 1% one-time compensation increase. The city proposed a 2% ongoing increase and a 1% one-time increase. And AFSCME 2384 countered that proposal with a 3.25% ongoing increase and a 1% 1, 1 one-time increase. As of yesterday, AFSCME offered a counterproposal of a 2% ongoing and a 1% one-time compensation increase. In year two, the fact finder recommended a 1% ongoing and 1% one-time increase the city proposed the same, 1% ongoing and 1% one-time. AFSCME 2384 proposed a 2% ongoing and 1% one-time increase, exceeding the fact finder's recommendation. And the proposal received yesterday by AFSCME 2384 reduced this amount, proposing a 1.5% ongoing increase and a 1% one-time increase, as well as any additional amount received by any other unit. The city obviously could not agree to this proposal because this language implies that they would receive the 0.25% signing incentive that units one and three received for bargaining to a complete agreement prior to fact finding. It is important to note here that the fact finder mischaracterized the 0.25% early signing incentive as a penalty. It was not. It was an incentive to encourage the parties 
to diligently work toward agreement prior to the costly and time-consuming process of fact-finding. It is also important to note that the fact-finder seemed to misunderstand the incentive as he misrepresented it as only available to the first unit to come to agreement. This is just patently false. The incentive was offered and was available to all bargaining units. In fact, two meet and, meet and confer units, units one and three, came to agreement prior to fact-finding and the signing incentive was subsequently approved as part of their contracts, both of their contracts, demonstrating that it was clearly not just for the first unit to sign. To further illustrate this point, um, or the effort that the city has made to reach a balanced agreement with unit two, they were also offered the additional half a percent ongoing compensation increase in year two that was agreed upon in the contracts just approved today with units four and five. However, they declined that offer as they did not want to reach a complete contract agreement which included the consistent work rules that the other groups have agreed to. Again, I want to emphasize the balanced approach that we have taken in negotiations this year, balancing employee needs, community needs, financial sustainability, and operational needs. In this vein, prior to negotiations, contract language was re reviewed and analyzed, and some key provisions were found to be inconsistent, creating disparities between employees. The city proposed modified work rule language in an effort to create consistency. For work groups with employees in multiple units, the proposed work rules would eliminate procedural discrepancies. The work rules that we have not been able to come to agreement with AFSCME 2384 on are as follows. Um, one, modified grievance procedures to be consistent with all other units. Two, modified fair and impartial language consistent with other units. This provision is related to the grievance procedures and is really about containing MOU grievances to the content of the MOU. Third, modified overtime calculation from daily to weekly to be consistent with the other civilian units and to provide flexibility to management and employees. And fourth, a new side ag agreement provision to be consistent with all other units. The key here for each of these items is consistency. Consistent application of procedures reduces disparities for employees from different bargaining units who are working side by side on the same team. So the city's recommendation is as follows. For economics, we recommend that the city council adopt the last economic proposal made to AFSCME 2384, which was 2% ongoing and 1% one time in year one, 1% 1 ongoing and 1% one time in year two. And for the work rules to adopt the four disputed work rules as proposed by the city and agreed to by other units to maintain consistency amongst all employees and units. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll move to the presentation by unit two. All right. I just want to explain before we start, um, I'm gonna be going over the economic portion and uh, where's he at? to the left of me is um, our attorney, Lumen and Enoch, Nikki, Nicholas Enoch, and he'll handle the work rule portions um, that, were, that are being disputed today. Uh, Mayor and City Council, my name is Mario Ayala, and I am the proud president of AFSCME Local 2384. I am sad in, that we have to be here today, but I am here to represent the dedicated men and women of Unit 2. Who are the men and women of Unit 2? They are the employees from traffic signals who keep our loved ones safe while traveling, the technicians who make the airport operate seamlessly, the operators who treat drinking water and make it safe for consumption, the auto mechanics who maintain police cruisers, fire engines, and ambulances, making them available to respond to vital calls. They are the dedicated employees who sacrifice for our community and our public service by taking a pay cut and furloughs to dig the city out of a $277 million deficit. Our members were looking forward to this round of negotiation 
as it appeared that better economic times were here for the city of Phoenix. I now ask that after you hear the facts, you will direct the city manager to go back to the table and negotiate in good faith and come to an agreement. In efforts to convey why we have not come to an agreement, I will be addressing the major roadblocks regarding our economic proposal submitted by the city. The necessity, all too often we hear that history repeats itself and many times it's easily dismissed. But here we are again, another negotiation where the city's budget is again uncertain <coughs> and talks of doom and gloom for the city's future. <laughs> we heard the city's budget director ponder the possibility of an economic downturn. And again, the city employees are expected to burden that cost. A new type of sacrifice is being asked to the employees, one that offers minuscule amounts of wage increases and removes economic security. After 11 years of sacrifice, accompanied by stagnant wages, the employees are now asked to settle for less. The last time Unit 2 employees received a true cost of living was in 2008. From 2008 to 2019, the Consumer Price Index for Arizona has increased by 8, 16%, meaning that this would require a 16% increase just to keep up with the inflation in 2019. The current offer includes a 3% increase. Let's talk about perspective and clarity. It's simple, 2008's money is not worth the same in 2019. Unit 2 electricians have gone without a true classification study in over 40 years. Yes, 40 years. I ask, in 40 years, would your job change? Of course it will. One would say that it would completely change. The running joke is that the city's department steal electricians from other departments due to the difficulty of recruiting externally. Could the reason be that the wage for this skill is behind by 16% just in inflation? The unjustified spending. The unit originally proposed a 19% increase over three years. This would not fully restore our buying power, but it would have placed our employees in a more sustainable position. The city manager and the budget director deemed a 19% increase unreasonable, irresponsible, and not fiscally sound for the citizens. A 19% increase to all units equally would have cost the city $102 million. This would have been less than the $150 million gift to the Phoenix Suns. Yes, we heard statements of the money being earmarked or how it's a necessity for revenue and growth in downtown. At the end of the day, a choice was made to place special interests first and employees last. I agree with Greta Rogers that the city is not in the business of giving out handouts to billionaire crybabies, and yet it has done so. We are not asking for a handout. We are merely asking for a fair package for the dedicated men and women who serve you. In 2016 through 2018, the city manager approved special merit increases to executive level management in the amount of $2.1 million. Under oath, the city manager confirmed he approved these merit increases. This included a salary increase of 11%, taking this executive from 150,000 to 170,000. This is the only, this is one of only, this is one of several hundred executives to receive this type of raise. And here we stand as Unit 2 employees being asked to accept 3% over the next two years. The unit members only ask that they receive the same compensation as other units. We simply seek an additional 0.5 increase in year two, yet the city manager finds this unacceptable and is unwilling to honor the favored nations. This is far from equitable treatment. The reason we failed to agree on a proposal. In four months, the city manager and his team have only made two economic proposals to Unit 2. This, this the unit cannot accept. During fact-finding, 
The city's chief negotiator admitted under oath that he had a better offer to make to the unit but never did so. One would question if this is indeed bargaining in good faith. Post fact finding and after the city council approved a contract for unit one and three, the city manager finally gave approval to submit a new economic proposal to unit two. Again, the proposal was less than the one previously approved by this council. We continue to question how we could have favor nations and not receive the same proposal. The proposal has not changed since April 8th of 2019. Again, why would the city manager not honor favor nations? Is this a strong arm tactic for using our rights to the fact finding process? Today, there are two approved economic proposals that are higher than the one proposed to Unit 2. Why would the members of Unit 2 or the leadership find this acceptable? In closing, we ask that you give new direction to the city manager to honor favor nations and offer Unit 2 the same proposal it has uh, approved for every other bargaining unit in the city. From our perspective, anything less would not honor the long-standing practice of favored nations and equitable treatment approved by this council. Thank you for your consideration. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego, members of the council. Uh, my name is Nicholas Enoch. I'm a partner with the law firm of Lubin and Enoch, and uh, I'm the attorney for Local 2384. I'm going to hit quickly on the work rules uh, that were taken up at the fact finding on March 27th and 28th. Now, as you are familiar, under, your, your, uh, the, under the code, once the parties get to a certain part of the impasse, they'll go out and, and the city will hire a neutral fact finder experienced in labor relations to make a determination after uh, hearing evidence, hearing testimony, reviewing documents, and the like. Uh, that's what happened here. Uh, uh, Steve Gutell, who is a very experienced uh, arbitrator and neutral here in Phoenix was selected. He actually has done previous fact findings for the city as well. Uh, Mr. Gattel, after two days, hearing testimony from the city manager, from various witnesses from the, uh, from the city, uh, found in favor of the union on all four of the issues that are before you today as far as work rule, all four of them. And I would encourage you to actually take a look. I can point to the pages in your packet for today and I'm gonna hit them real quickly. Uh, issue number two was about side agreements. That's addressed in, on page 450 of the packet. What the fact finder found correctly was that as suggested by the union, this proposal appears to be a solution seeking a problem. Succinctly, nobody is requiring the city to enter into side agreements that go on indefinitely. That doesn't need to be memorialized in the MOU. All they have to do is simply say, we're not going to do it. So there's no point, no reason for including this in the MOU. And that was what the fact finder found. I would also point that on page 417 of the submission, which was the paper submitted by the city, they say in there under this that having hundreds, if not thousands of side agreements since the 1970s, the city needs this language. I can tell you that before the hearing, I made a request to the city for all side agreements between local 2384 and the city. I got less than 10. I think it was six, it might have been eight, it was less than 10. So unless all of the other units have thousands of them out there, I don't know what they're talking about. I do see that I have one second. So may I extend like two minutes? Uh, Mario has an additional four minutes in cards. So we'll add four minutes if, if Mario is willing. He's, all right. Okay, four more minutes, great. Um, issue three, which is the fair and impartial language, that is addressed by the fact finder on page 451 of your packet. We sat through the hearing. There was not a single example provided by the city as to an abuse, a problem, or anything with respect to Unit 2's fair and impartial language. Nothing was submitted. So this also appears to be a solution in search of a problem. I would suggest that there's an additional problem with this proposal. This is proposal M4 that um, 
Management 4 proposal that's included in the packet, which is who at the city is going to determine what arises under, quote, a specific express term of the MOU? That, there's an ambiguity built right in to the city's proposal uh, in the far, fair and impartial language. And you know, for the reasons set forth by the, by the fact finder that we hired and paid, uh, that proposal should be rejected as well. Issue four was the grievance procedure. This is the proposal from the city. It's M11. The arbitrator's, or the fact finder's decision and rationale can be found on pages 453 and 454 of the packet. And briefly, there, there's at least five problems with the city's proposal, five. First, it provides that if there's any method of review provided anywhere else by any entity, a grievance is not permitted. So the question becomes, who gets to decide if there's an avenue of redress or review available somewhere else? How would this employee know that it's available somewhere else? And why would the city even want city employees to be running off to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the United States Department of Labor, OSHA, all these other agencies to make these complaints? Would the city, was it not to the, to the benefit of the city and to the, and to the union to have that addressed through the grievance process? Why are we pushing all of this stuff out elsewhere? Number two, uh, the language about skipping steps in the grievance process is ambiguous. And I'll give you an example. Page 477 of the submission, this is just one of the steps. This goes from step one of the grievance to step two of the grievance. And here's how it ends. So it explains what happens in step one. And then at the end it says, the parties by written mutual agreement may move the grievance to step two of the grievance procedure. That's the city's proposal. So by mutual Written agreement may move the step to grievance to the step of the grievance procedure. What happens if the city doesn't agree to move it forward in writing? What if you file a grievance, they hear it, they say, no, we don't think it's any good, and the union's like, okay, well, let's go to the next step. The city won't agree to it in writing to move it to the next step. I read that, that that's the end of the process. It's over. So this whole process that they've drafted is illusory. Problem number three, limiting the arbitrator to the language of the MOU and department rules and regulations is problematic. I've, in my practice, I've seen employer rules and regulations which are unwise. At times, they're illegal. So you're going to go do an arbitration, and we're going to have illegal work rules, and the arbitrator is going to be required to ignore what the law is, but he's going to have to, or she is going to have to abide by them. That's, it's, it's ridiculous on its face. The fact finder agreed with the union in, in that regard. Problem four, there's a proposed limits on the employee's right to grieve while not on the employer. Everything that took place here limiting uh, impacts the employees, but not the employer. Uh, problem number five is, and you can see this on page 479, the arbitrator is required to follow state and city code, state law and city code, but not federal law. So uh, I have one more issue I could get through in 30 seconds. Uh, that is overtime, M6. Arbitrator's ruling on that can be found on page 456. This gives the supervisor and an employee the unlimited uh, authority, the, or actually gives the supervisor the unlimited authority to grant flex time to employees. Two problems, supervisors, play nice to their friends and not so nice to others. It should not be unfettered discretion to a supervisor to provide overtime to whoever they want. Most unions have overtime equalization to prevent exactly that. This doesn't provide that. This allows a supervisor to pick and choose who he or she wants to provide it to. Secondly, this provides a cost savings to the city because it's avoiding overtime. That was never costed as part of their economic proposal. So we don't know what the city would save on this and how it could go towards the economic package, for example, that, that Local 2384 provides. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, we request that you give it thorough consideration, and we will see you down the road. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, Dolores Henderson, uh, uh, two people donated cards, giving her six minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. My name is Dolores Henderson. I am the proud Vice President of Ask Me Local 2384. I have been in this position for only six months and it has been an eye opener. It is difficult to believe how the city comes up with ways to keep employees from receiving a cost of living raise. They tell us we are the reason there's an issue with our pension and we are not. They tell us we need to think of our customers, we are customers too. They say we need to think of the taxpayers, we are taxpayers too. I understand police and fire are important, but they need vehicles to do their job. Who maintains their vehicles? We do. Fire needs water, and we provide the water they need to do their job. We are part of public safety. We maintain the traffic lights and street lights so that you can reach your destination safely. We maintain the street lights in your neighborhoods and per strict permits. We provide safe drinking water and also the way to get it to you. We process wastewater in order to be able to discharge it back into our environment. We drive on the streets. We depend on the lights in our neighborhoods for safety. We drink the water, and we make sure that the water we discharge is good for our wildlife and us. And we also provide cooling water for the Palo Verde nuclear plant. I cannot believe I am standing in front of city council and the mayor trying to justify why city employees deserve more. City employees have gone 11 years without a cost of living raise. We took years of concessions to help the city with its budget. We sacrificed for the city to stay in the black and to ensure that there was no reduction in force. For the last four contracts, the city said there was no money. This year, they said there is some money, but if we want this little bit of money, we need to give up our rights. Giving up, giving up our money for the last 11 years was not enough. While we were in concessions, because there was no money for us, somehow there was money for executive management to receive increases totaling over $2 million. There was money for the Phoenix Suns in the amount of $145 million, and there's over $230 million in unrestricted funds. We are told that with this increase of a 3%, we'll be getting everything we gave up. How is that possible? We will be at the point we should have been 11 years ago. Therefore, we're still 11 years behind. We were told that the budget is two years behind. In other words, today's budget is based on monies for two years ago. Well, the economy has been booming for at least four years, so where is the money? Due to no raise, raises for the past 11 years, the city of Phoenix has become a training ground. Employees are hired, some see their first check, and they leave. Others stay long enough to get their training, licenses, and certifications, then go to another municipality. We were told by the budget director that we should be grateful that we have a job. For the record, I love my job and am grateful for my job. When I look around and I see that I deal with chemicals that, would, that could kill me or my coworkers, equipment that could also kill us or maim us, breathe in air that could affect our health for the rest of our lives, handle sludge that carry diseases, and morale that is at an all-time low. I think we deserve more. I'm not standing here asking for a ridiculous amount of money. I am standing here asking for respect and dignity. We keep the city running by providing clean water, maintain city vehicles that are safe to drive, and maintain the streets to drive them on. Some of us have been doing this for over 15 years, and all we want is the city to show that they do appreciate city employees like they claim they do. They say we are family, then treat us as family. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We have Richard Ray followed by Barry McCain. This is an exceptionally frustrating thing to have to talk about because it implies, if I'm, if I'm not in favor, it implies that I don't appreciate the workers for the city of Phoenix or that they're not doing a good job. I just have a giant problem with two things in these presentations. Number one, as you may or may not be aware, there are probably easily a thousand different ways to calculate the cost of living. In point of fact, what we're really talking about is People in, improve their jobs, they improve what they're doing, they're increased, they get raises, things like that. We're not talking about something that they're just only getting cost of living. And that's a problem, and the calculation of same, oftentimes you'll find, move around dramatically. I also have something of a problem with how you manage people. Having operated companies, having operated and having people around, I don't I don't accept or do not feel that it makes the most sense to have the employees be 
controlled by the union uh, rules as compared to having the supervisors being able to move the people where they need to be, when they need to be, and obviously sometimes the recognition that the people that are doing the work are better prepared, better trained, and can do a better job. So therefore, those two things, the fifth one, which was discussed, and the cost of living is something that bothers me. So that's why I came down to talk about it. Thank you. Barry McCain. Mayor Gallegos, uh, City Council, staff, thank you for listening to me. My name is Barry McCain from Arizona City. I'm, uh, I'm an AFSCME retiree. I've been watching negotiations, and I agree with everything that's been said so far for the union. We've conceded and conceded. One thing no one said that I actually watched happen here in the MOU going from one MOU to another, two pages, critically uh, pages taken out of the second one that was in the first one. Now, I would like to see, I love Phoenix, I do, and I love my union, but I wanna see us talk with each other, not at each other. What's been going on, you're just force feeding it down on the union, and the union is the backbone of this city. I appreciate what you're doing, but money is not the most important thing to keep an employee here. We need to have people to actually sit down and deal in good faith. And I haven't been seeing that on the part of the city council. Uh, but I know that we can do this and, and we have to do it. It's either we do it or we, we perish. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the cards we have today. Go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have any council member questions or comments? Tell me your name. All right, come on down. Reopen the public hearing. Sorry, I had yours as marked for Mario's time. Thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council, for allowing me to speak. <clears throat> Hello, my name is James McNeil. I'm a longtime City of Phoenix resident at uh, 3441 North 40th Street. I'm a Navy veteran and a City of Phoenix employee for 20 years. I'm here to talk about the current contract the city's offering, the uh, uh, Unit 2 bargaining unit. I work as a uh, senior utility operator in the Water Services Department, and I operate a water treatment uh, <coughs> facility here in Phoenix that uh, provides drinking water to the public. I currently hold a grade four license in water treatment and wastewater treatment with the state of Arizona that allows me to treat water. Um, like the public uh, fire department and police, I'm not easily replaced because of that license. I feel the offer that the city has made is unfair and um, will make it very difficult to find quality people to do my job in the future. I'm hearing that other smaller cities are paying more for operations and this will entice the new employees to go if the city does not uh, remain competitive. I personally took uh, a demotion from team leader when the water services department reorganized five years ago, and this raise won't even bring me up to that level of pay that I lost. <clears throat> I feel the city has out negotiated itself and uh, this low offer will have an adverse effect on employee morale and um, re employee retention. As a citizen, a ratepayer, taxpayer and water treatment operator, I urge, I urge the city to offer a fair wage increase and show its appreciation to its employees who have sacrificed in their time of need and helped out to bring, helping bring new quality people back in to replace the people who are aging out. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, if, we, if it was marked as for donation of time, then we, we have art, but it will do a final two minutes and then we will close the public hearing. Hello, uh, my name is Rudy Leva. 
And I'm proud to say I'm a Phoenician, born and raised here in Phoenix, Arizona. Went to school down the street at Phoenix Union High School. One of my biggest goals was to become a city employee. I came from the outside, so I know what it's about out there. And I was um, with Mario right here. It's been since 2008 since I got a cost of living raise. I got uh, my daughter, my grandchildren I support, and I really enjoy working for the city. I brag about the Phoenix Convention, there's where I'm from. I, I, I'm there representing all the Unit 2 employees that uh, make the city shine with the Convention Center. And um, you know, all we wanna do is be treated equal. We took all the cuts you guys asked for we had to give up vacation, furlough time. And if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong, but our sister cities gave in last year during their negotiations. They brought their employees up. And you know, we just want a fair share. I don't think we're asking for very much. We are the ones that make this place shine. You guys are the backbone, but we make this place shine as city employees, unit two employees. And I think all my brothers and sisters are, are doing one heck of a job. And uh, I'm proud to be an Ask Me member from 2384. And I, I wish you guys would really consider what we're asking for. And you guys can really shine if you make the right decision. I want to thank you guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Closed for final uh, this time. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, President Ayala had committed to us it would be a presentation focused on facts and uh, not personal attacks, and we really appreciate that you met that commitment. Thank you so much. Um, from my perspective, when we did bargaining three years ago, I talked about at the time consistency across unions and units, and I, that's my same feeling today. Would love to see a package that is consistent with the other two we approved today. Uh, do any council members have any comments or questions? Councilman Nowakowski. So I heard over and over that, uh, that um, what is it, the um, favorite nations, that there's a violation. So is there a violation of our favorite nations um, that happened with um, Unit 2 compared to um, all the other units? And can you give us some clarification on that too? Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. Um, the favored nations clause, so favored nations agreements were accompanied the accompanied the 0.25 early signing incentive for groups that signed a completed agreement prior to fact finding. So there is no fairness agreement signed with unit two going forward after fact finding. So basically what's happening is that it was an incentive for those individuals before fact finding to sign on board and how many unions actually signed before fact finding? Two units executed completed agreements but prior to fact finding, unit one and unit three. So unit one and unit three actually received that incentive of, what is it, 1.25? 0 0.25. So we're talking about unit two, we're talking about the um, police, fire, they didn't receive that incentive, right? That is correct. Yeah. And the other thing I was, um, we heard was the um, discussion on the, um, what was it called? Um, when somebody's um, reprimanded um, and that there wasn't a fair, um, if we agree not to, um, to continue it, it would just die from there. It wouldn't go from step one to step two. Is that true? Uh, Mayor, members of council. Our grievance, I'm sorry, Nowakowski. grievance. Um, the, there is a sentence in the, in the grievance procedure that is intended to, if parties mutually agree, move the grievance, skip step. So skip step one, skip two, step two if needed. Um, we are certainly willing to rework that sentence to make it more clear that it's a mutual agreement to skip steps, not to move it on to the next step. Because I just want to make sure that our employees, if they have a grievance with any of the departments or supervisors, that it's not up to the city to basically deny the process or the next step in the grievance process. So that's something that we're gonna make sure that it just doesn't die at step one, right? 
Yes, Mayor, members, Council, Councilman Nolkowski, the grievance procedure, the very next sentence at the start of step two states that if the, if the grievant is, unsatis is not satisfied with the response in step one, they move it to step two. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Pastor. Um, point two five, wasn't that an incentive? Yes, Mayor, okay. Councilwoman Pastor, it was an incentive. It was a signing incentive to come to a complete agreement prior to fact-finding. It was only eligible to those who completed those criteria. Okay, so point two five was the incentive. Please explain to me the definition of favorite nation. So, Mayor, members of the Council, Councilwoman Pastor, um, favorite nation means that it, the first group to sign is not at a disadvantage for coming to an agreement where subsequent agreements might result in a greater compensation package or some other benefit. It allows those initial signers or signer to receive those same benefits that may come later in the process. My understanding that favorite nation uh, I don't have the exact definition, but my understanding of a favorite nation is that when groups sign or a u different unit receives a different uh, percentage or, I'm gonna use percentage, percentage uh, say from 1% to uh, 1.25. I should probably use, well, let me use 1.30. Um, a favorite nation clause is that then all units receive the same benefit. And what I'm hearing differently and how I'm interpreting what you're saying is that you're saying favorite nations was part of uh, their agreement beforehand. If they didn't sign uh, the contract, I say, or proposal contract uh, before fact-finding, then favorite nations was then taken away and also the .25 incentive was taken away. Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Pastor, the .25 incentive was only eligible, or was only available to the unions before fact-finding. Right. Once that right. point was reached, they were no longer eligible if they had not come to a complete agreement by that Correct. point. Correct. Units one and three also signed what is known as a fairness agreement, which is an agreement as part of the negotiations process. It's not part of the contract, but it's an agreement that they will receive the most favored nation treatment as things progress. So if, for example, units four, five, or two receive something greater than what they agreed to, they will also receive that. But above and beyond that, the 0.25 incentive is not subject to most favored nations. And we were Correct. very clear about that. So units one and three are receiving 0.25 more than what unit four and five received by approval today. So they'll receive the additional half percent that was added to units four and five's contract plus the 0.25 signing incentive. Okay, I have six. Okay, so what I am hearing is that you had to sign the fairness agreement in order to get or qualify or be part of the favorite nations. So then I'm hearing there's two different pieces. One was you sign, if you sign before fact finding, the incentive would be 1.25, I mean 0.25, okay, if you signed before fact-finding. If you went to, you, okay, so then there was a fairness agreement, and if you signed the fairness agreement and you went to fact-finding, because I'm trying to figure this out. So, we're kind of speaking in hypotheticals here, but um, Mayor, members of the council, the, um, the fairness agreement applies to things that happen after a particular unit signs an agreement. 
So whether that happens, you know, before fact finding or after fact finding, what what there's what the fairness agreement says is I'm not going to get a worse deal because I'm agreeing earlier in the process. The signing incentive, you are accurate in saying that that's separate. The signing incentive is on top of whatever else the package turns out to be for the express purpose of coming to a complete agreement prior to fact finding. So that eligibility went away for the, signing, for the signing incentive for the point okay, two the five. The signing incentive went away when if you went to fact finding. Occurred. finding. That's so correct. then where does the fairness agreement come into play? So the fairness agreement comes into play for who, whichever units have signed so that if something better comes along for another unit after they've signed, they will also receive that. So it would probably be helpful if I gave you an example. Right. So unit one signed their agreement. They received 2% ongoing and 1% one time in year one, 1% 1 ongoing and 1% 1, one time in year two plus the 0.25 signing agreement upon approval. Later on today, Units four and five received a package which included an additional half percent ongoing in year two. So now that that has been approved, because of the most favored nations agreement or the fairness agreement, unit one will now receive 1.5 percent ongoing in year two. And they will still receive the 0.25 signing agreement on top of that, or signing incentive, excuse me. Can we, Councilman Waring, ask a Vice Mayor Waring? Thank you. So, I don't see how this would be a violation of, of anything that you're saying, because if the first group signs for a 1% increase and the last group signs for a 2% increase, the first group gets the 2%, but the reverse is not true. Mayor, Vice Mayor, that's accurate. Isn't that just kind of summing up everything you guys said? Yeah. Hopefully pretty succinctly. So to say that it's violating some sort of, no, it would only be the case if they were getting more, not less. If okay. they were getting more than the first group that signed, right? That's what most favored nation is. Mayor, Vice Mayor, that's accurate. That is the purpose of most favored nation is so that someone signing later doesn't receive a better package than someone signing earlier. But again, the 0.25% signing incentive was separate and apart from the most right. favored nation agreement. Right, so uh, the last group doesn't necessarily have a right to that, That's but correct. the first group would have a right to it if the last group got it. Because otherwise nobody would ever be the first to sign. That's right. correct. I mean, I, I, whatever I think about these contracts, uh, you know, it, I, I get the, the theory, nobody would want to be first because they want to see what the other guys are gonna get. And that takes that out of it. That's correct. So the, f the first group is going to get the first group is going to get the biggest the best contract that any of the others could negotiate, but the reverse is not necessarily true. Mayor, members of the council, in this case, that is true because uh, no. the first two groups, in fact, because they were the ones that agreed before fact finding, so they're going to receive the largest package of the five union groups. But I guess what I meant is, if this group was getting a bigger package than the first two groups were getting you would up the package of the first two groups right? because yes. of the most favored nation. That's correct. Councilwoman Mendoza. Thank you, Mayor. The favor nation policy, has it always applied in the same manner in every labor negotiation? Um, Mayor, members of the council, Councilwoman Mendoza, um, I was not here for previous negotiations, but it is my understanding um, that it has been historically true that that each group has received the same package. Um, the difference here is that for the first time we offered a signing incentive. That hasn't been done in the past, um, to my knowledge, and it was done with the express purpose of incentivizing you know, collaboration and coming to an agreement prior to the uh, process of fact finding, and that was specifically separate and apart from the most favored nation application. So it's different than, than anything that we've done historically. Um, but, but to answer your question, um, as far as I know, the packages have been applied equally, um, by and large at least, over the years. 
Can someone answer that question, though? Because has it always applied the same manner? Has no. Favor Nation always applied the same manner in every labor negotiation? Mayor, Councilman Mendoza, uh, there's a couple things here. Uh, first of all, it has, in my memory, uh, been applied in the same way in that all groups have received the same overall compensation package. I'm going to put an asterisk on that for two things. First, in 2008, after things were negotiated and outside of it, the city uh, gave a bigger, uh, gave a, 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 a market adjustment to the police and fire units. That was done after negotiation and outside of negotiation. So that sometime is remembered by people as when we treated people differently. The other asterisk I'll put to it is that has been a philosophy that management and the council have held, which is th that uh, in, the, in the past that um, we don't think that one group uh, deserves a bigger cost of living raise than another group because all employees are uh, working in the same way as, as was expressed and that we, we reflect the difference in the pay rate not in the rate in the uh, compensation adjustment so in other words a police officer makes let's say seventy five thousand dollars a year and that's different from say a clerk and we show that by this police officer makes 75 and the clerk makes 35 as opposed to the police officer should get a 10 percent raise and the clerk should get a one percent raise what has been i think a little confused here in my conversations and listening is the philosophy that we should treat employees the same uh, c carries through to a complete agreement, not just to the economics. So that's a bit of our dispute here is that we think a complete agreement includes economics plus discussion of work rules. Uh, and, and so that's, I think, where some of the disagreement comes. We have, I think we held the full public hearing and we gave extra time beyond cards, so I would love to move forward if, if that's okay. Okay. All right, so with that, then I think we have completed this agenda item and we'll move to public comment. We have six public comments today, started by uh, first Hilda Hernandez, followed by Zachary Morgan. Hello, my name is Hilda Hernandez. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you for listening to me. My name is Hilda Hernandez. I own and am rehabbing four small homes at the southeast corner of 15th Avenue and Taylor. Our community being so close to CAS has many problems, but throughout the years I've noticed that small changes make a big impact in our area. With that in mind, I'm here to talk about a specific halfway home at 1402 West Polk Street. It is a halfway home to undesirable males that of various ages. What makes these tenants undesirable is not who they are, but what they do day and night. 1402 West Polk hosted for months and until last week an encampment of about 30 drug dealers, prostitutes, homeless trash pickers, and bike thieves. I want to thank the City of Phoenix for cleaning that encampment last week. However, it's starting to form again with an inoperable vehicle as home to two males that remained. They urinate and defecate where they need. All tenants of 1402 West Polk and their transient guests never use their front door on Polk. Instead, all pedestrian and quickie vehicle traffic to this address is done through our adjoining alley, which is also next to my homes. The large concentration of undesirable men and women has made it impossible for my tenants to feel safe taking out their trash or for me to feel safe while volunteering my time to clean the alley of trash and graffiti. A camera was installed high on a pole in the alley next to my house and I'm interested in communicating with the owner of such equipment and what's recorded. I'm also interested in learning what regulations, expectations, and preempted community safety is already established for a halfway house specializing in tenants such as the ones at 1402 West Polk Street? Thank you for your time. Okay. 
Thank you. Zachary Morgan will be followed by Nick Thomas. Mayor and City Council members, uh, we come again today to remind you that precious preborn babies are being murdered by way of abortion throughout the valley. As our governing leaders, it's your solemn, sworn, and primary duty to protect innocent life, and you're failing to do that on behalf of the most defenseless and oppressed among us. The time for you to protect them is now. We are asking you to do two things. Uphold current Arizona state law 13-3603, which makes abortion punishable by law, and make Phoenix a sanctuary city for the unborn. We are not your enemy, and we do not hate you. We don't come here to attack you, but to do what God commands us to do, and that's love our neighbors by speaking in defense of those who cannot speak for themselves. We really don't enjoy coming here, but because you're allowing the bloodshed to continue and giving your support to a place like Planned Parenthood, an organization responsible for the deaths of close to 8 million human beings, we must continue to fight for life. God commands our obedience and negligence of his commands comes at a very great, very great cost. God commands us to obey his law and we all will be held accountable to his law when he judges each and every one of us. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that judgment, when each one of us die, we will face Jesus Christ in judgment. He is going to judge every thought and word and deed, and he is not going to judge us based upon standards of morality that we've constructed for ourselves. He's going to judge us based upon the perfect standard of his holy law. If we've broken even one of his laws, then we will stand guilty in his sight. Romans 3.23 says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because God is holy, righteous, and good, the just punishment for all lawbreakers is an everlasting punitive sentence in a place called hell. I wouldn't want hell to be the final destination for my worst enemies, and I don't want any of you to end up there because of your sins against God. Those who support abortion, an activity that God clearly hates, give clear evidence that they are not right with God. What they need is what Jesus and he alone has to offer, and that is salvation, forgiveness, and redemption. God is not only holy and righteous and just, but he's also loving, gracious, and kind. 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect law-abiding life that we can never live and received in himself upon the cross a punishment for sins he did not deserve but we rightly deserve. He then rose from the grave demonstrating that it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. Today is the day of salvation. The day that we stand before Jesus Christ in judgment will not be a day of bribing the judge but will be a day of sentencing. The commands from God are to repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus Christ alone. And I beg you to consider the good news today. The test of uh, the genuineness of your faith is that your heart will begin to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. That's how you know that you're truly born again. And God hates abortion. Nick Thomas of Litchfield Park, followed by Luke Peterson of Gilbert. We are going to be online. I have to go pick up my daughter from school. Good afternoon, Phoenix City Council members. My name is Nick Thomas, and I'm an itinerant pastor here in the Valley. I appreciate this opportunity to talk, and as you lend your ear to me, I would just like to say that this isn't something that I enjoy doing for kicks on a Wednesday afternoon. However, when the murder of unborn children is taking place under the watch and care, and quite frankly, lack thereof from you, one must set aside all other matters and speak up. Countless numbers of babies have been murdered inside their mother's wombs under the ruse of healthcare. With popular notions attached to an unethical love from Christless, God-rejecting organizations like Planned Parenthood, who state that they are pro-women and then slaughter the little women inside the womb. Abortion is nowhere near pro-women, and it is certainly not healthcare. Back in the 1960s, and some of you may remember this, a professor named Joseph Fletcher proposed an ethical theory that in whatever situation you may be in and are forced to make an ethical decision, regardless of its nature, it can be good as long as it's done with love. And this, isn't that just lovely? Lying, stealing, and yes, even killing can be morally right if done with love and the benefit of another person. He called it situation ethics. It also just so happened that Fletcher was a huge proponent of abortion and eugenics twisting the very morality that is innately in all men and women by the image of God that is given to them. Fletcher enabled and supported the murder 
of babies, why he smiled and said, I love you. What you're allowing, counsel, by not enforcing the Arizona law that states abortion as a criminal offense, AZ 13-3603, is no different than Fletcher's heinous and dangerous distortion of morality. Every baby that gets murdered under your watch, you whisper, health care. Christ, our great God and Savior, is the ultimate standard of morality, and there is no situation that could ever trump that. And he will hold you accountable in the day of judgment. If you don't believe me, I implore you to open up a Bible to Exodus chapter 20 and read the Decalogue known as the Ten Commandments. And if you need further elaboration on that, go to endabortionnow.com. We'll be happy to show you. Please, we are pleading with you, as well as warning you, stop the murder of unborn children and make Phoenix a sanctuary city for them. And stop participating in the spirit of situation ethics. We will, we're not, we will not relent from this plea, and we will continue to speak until this ends. Thank you. Luke Pearson followed by Joshua Walker. Esteemed Phoenix City Council, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Reverend Luke Pearson. I am the discipleship pastor at Apologia Church in Mesa and co-founder of End Abortion Now. You all know by now why we come here to speak to you. It is to protect the lives of our pre-born neighbors, your very own pre-born constituents, to encourage you to uphold Arizona Revised Statute 13-3603, calling abortion murder, to plead with you to make Phoenix a sanctuary city for these beautiful children, to allow these precious little ones an opportunity to have their inalienable rights that were granted to them by our forefathers and by their creator. We are extremely grateful that you allow your citizens this time to voice our concerns. My question for you all today, however, is do you seriously care when we come up here to speak? Do you genuine, genuinely care what the citizens under your jurisdiction are concerned with? The same ones that have voted you into power and the same ones that can vote you out. We, the people, are ultimately the ones that you are accountable to. You can say um, with your mouth that you care, but your actions speak otherwise. You have moved citizen comments to the end, and we know that you're required to not sit here and listen to us. And uh, um, by the way, I'm not sure who the gentleman was earlier that came up. As soon as our, our time came up to speak, he started talking to all you guys and distracting you, which I will say is, is frustrating for us. Um, uh, Mayor Gallego, I thank you for your attention this week. As I noticed last, last time we were here, you got up and left in the middle of a mentally challenged man speaking, so thank you for your attention today. I appreciate that. I would like to speak to Councilman DeCicio. Unfortunately, I see he's not here again today, but I will say this, and I hope he's able to hear this. Sir, I must express my disappointment in you. You sat here and told us how pro-life you are and how you support our endeavors. That last time we were here, while attending via your phone, you hung up in the middle of a brave young mother pleading for the lives of these children. Respectfully, sir, your pro-life words are meaningless if your actions do not back them up. And the same goes for you, Councilman Waring. You are supported by Arizona's largest pro-life groups, and yet you continue to sneer and grin and half the time don't pay attention when we are pleading for life. Respectfully, sir, it is also your time to back up your pro-life label with your actions. Today, I plead with you to do the hard thing. Please do not ignore us. The easy thing is to pretend like 40 precious babies are not being murdered in their mother's wombs every day in this state. The painless thing is to not consider how incredible it is that your very own mothers chose life for you. The cowardly thing is not trying to visualize children being torn limb from limb or imagining the sound of a tiny skull being crushed by a pair of metal forceps held in the hands of a hired assassin or wondering what it must feel like to be chemically burned alive in your mother's womb. Please be brave, please be courageous. If you have any questions, please visit endabortionnow.com. To God alone be the glory. Thank you. Joshua Walker, followed by our final comment of the day, Marsha Clark Campbell. Mayor, City Council, my name is Joshua Walker. I'm a pastor at Church of the Redeemer and a professor of philosophy at a local university. I'm here today to stand up for the most persecuted minority in the United States, I'm here today to speak up for a group that cannot speak for themselves, 
the unborn. The moral issue here is very simple and clear. All the arguments used to justify this senseless slaughter of this people group are only meant to obfuscate and cloud the clear moral issue. Let me explain. We are told that it's a matter of choice. We are told that it's a woman's right to do with her body what she wants. Let me ask you, how many arms does a woman have that is six months pregnant? You probably think that's a silly question. Of course, she has two. But see, in that answer, it shows that it's not a matter of the woman's body. If it were about her body, she would have four arms. But she only has two. The baby also has two. Let me ask you this. At what point in your life were you your mother? Yes, when were you your mother? Again, the answer is obvious. You were never your mother. But if that's true, then you were never part of her body. This is not an issue of woman's rights to do with her body what she wants. We are also told that the fetus, a euphemism for a baby, is not a human person. But what else could it be? The size of the baby does not change its personhood. If this were the case, many of you would be less human than those that were bigger. The fact that the baby is located inside the womb does not change its personhood. Where a person is located does not change the fact that they are a person. If I am in this chamber, if I'm in my house, or if I'm in my car, I'm still a person. The baby is still a person both inside and outside of the womb. Some say the level of development of the baby means it's not a person. This simply cannot hold water. Its development makes you a person. If development makes you a person, then is my five-year-old son any less of a person than you or I? Finally, some say that the baby is dependent upon the mother, and because of this, it is not a person. We are all dependent on others for life, especially a newborn baby. If being dependent upon another for life means we are not a person, then there are many groups of people that we would say are not people, such as newborns and the elderly. Again, the moral issue here is crystal clear. To end the life of a baby in the womb is murder. I ask you, do the moral thing. Stand up for this oppressed, persecuted, and maligned people group. Be bold and courageous. Stand up for the unborn. Please enforce Arizona Revised Statute 13-3603, which is intended to outlaw abortion. Please do your job. Enforce the law. Thank you. Marsha Clark Campbell of Phoenix is our final comment today. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, city, other city council members, I am a retiree. I have just moved downtown to 613 North 4th Avenue, Phoenix Silvercrest, where we're about 125 senior citizens. Um, I, um, I have been in this city since 2009. October, so it's 10 years, but I have been living, I lived on the east side and then I went over to the west. God moved me to the west side, I was in Glendale. Um, what I, I want to, I want to ac uh, accept and acknowledge the sentiments of the speakers before me, uh, but I'm not here to talk about the unborn, I, not that I'm negating them, I agree with everything that, that all the comments that were made before me, but I'm here to talk about, about the people who are here with us present, especially the retirees and even those who, what I found appalling when I've come down here in just one month, little over a month I've been here downtown, I'm so appalled at the homelessness um, and there are many of them are veterans who have served us honorably. And that's one thing that I'm appalled at. And I do, I should have mentioned that I was involved since 2011 with Ability 360, which you guys know that they have just, thank God, they've opened the um, light rail station there. And so now 
this state that has the highest persons with disabilities in the contiguous United States, and that Ability360 has been doing so much in this uh, city for the disabled, which like I say includes vets. But I'm interested more in the homelessness that I've seen here downtown. And today, just on my way over to this m council meeting, you know, there's a Native American who has been greeting me from the time I came to live here, and he, I've been talking with him, and he's, he, I mean, he's, he's avail you know, he's a, a person who is, um, he's eligible for a lot of benefits as a Native American, and he's not aware of all of this. And right across the street, as I'm talking with him, there's a citizen who is pulling up weeds right opposite a, it's an abandoned lot, or I'm not sure who owns it. But the point I'm making is, all that I've heard here today, and I'm shocked, quite frankly, at the deficit of this city, 277 million. Um, all that I've heard here today <coughs> is that each individual person can do their little part to make a change in this city. Thank and you. I, you know, with someone pulling up weeds or even the homeless doing things. I'm, I'm involved with the food bank over on East Thomas. Thank you. Your time is complete. Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned.